Hello, guys. Sorry for a little bit of a late start here today. I uh, <laughs> do have a few things at the top, so please uh, bear with me if you could. Uh, today, Secretary Kerry hosted Mexican Foreign Secretary Claudia Ruiz Maciu for a bilateral meeting at the Department of State. Secretary Kerry and the Foreign Secretary discussed a wide range of bilateral and regional issues, uh, including expanding trade and economic growth, increasing educational exchanges, ensuring safe and orderly migration, and ongoing security cooperation between our two countries. Our relationship with Mexico is strong and vital, and our close partnership reflects deep institutional, economic, personal, and cultural bonds. The United States and Mexico remain committed to an active par partnership focused on the advancement of shared goals, ensuring strong economic growth, good jobs, safe and secure communities, respect for human rights and democracy, and of course, expanded opportunity for all of our citizens. Uh, the meeting just finished and just wrapped up, um, and it was, uh, it was very, uh, very thorough, a very positive, uh, very productive discussion. On Japan, the United States and Japan have agreed in principle on a new five-year package of host nation support for U.S. forces in Japan. The package is valued at 189.9 billion yen in the final year of the agreement, which is 2020. That's approximately $1.6 billion at current exchange rates, with an average annual cost sharing of 189.3 billion yen. By covering a share of the cost for our base workforce, utilities, training relocation, and facilities improvement, this host nation support package will help sustain the U.S. military presence in Japan, which, as you know, is a key part of the United States' rebalance to Asia and to the Pacific. We appreciate the cooperation embodied in Japan's host nation support. This new package will complement a series of significant accomplishments that have strengthened our alliance over the past year. On Libya. The United States welcomes the announcement that Libyans will sign tomorrow in Morocco the political agreement drafted after a year of UN-facilitated political dialogue. The agreement provides the framework for establishing a unified Libyan government of national accord. We applaud the efforts of these courageous Libyan leaders who are ready to rebuild a united Libya. A government of national accord is needed to address the country's critical humanitarian, economic, and security challenges. At the December 13th conference on Libya in Rome, co-chaired by Secretary Kerry and Italian Foreign Minister Gentiloni, the United States and the international community made it clear that we stand ready to support the implementation of the political agreement and are committed to providing the unified government full political backing and technical, economic, security, and counterterrorism assistance. We encourage all political actors to support this final agreement and call on all Libyans to unite behind the Libya political agreement and the government of national accord. Finally, on travel, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but just to put it out there uh, more officially, uh, <coughs> the Secretary will travel to New York City tomorrow. I'm sorry, on Friday. He will depart tomorrow but the, to, for the meetings on Friday to chair uh, a UN Security Council meeting on Syria to reinforce efforts to accelerate an end to the conflict, including necessary formal negotiations between representatives of the Syrian government and the opposition. The Secretary will also host a meeting of the International Syria Support Group, the ISSG, in New York to discuss next steps in efforts to foster a nationwide ceasefire and parallel political transition negotiations to end the conflict while intensifying the fight against ISIL. With that, Brad. I wanted to start uh, with Syria. Um, can you explain at this point how the U.S. position on Assad is different from Russia's position on Assad, on Assad's future? Well, I'm not going to talk for Russia and what they feel is Assad's place. What I can tell you is, well, but, I mean, it just wouldn't be appropriate. Well, you but, talk about Russia a lot with Assad, that they're uh, military. But you're asking, me to, okay, you're asking me to describe their policies, and I won't do that. But, but what I will say is that nothing has changed. And we've talked about this before. Nothing's changed about our view that Assad cannot be the future of Syria, that you can't have um, a unified, whole, pluralistic, non-sectarian Syria where people feel safe and secure and can stay home or go home. Um, 
with Assad still in power. And we've said that um, from the very beginning. Well, no, not from the very, very beginning. Uh, I think on, in 2011, if we stroll back down memory lane, uh, President Obama said, the time has come for Assad to step aside. He didn't say step aside in the future, step aside at one undetermined day according to mutual consent when he feels ready. It was he had to leave immediately. And there's been countless examples since. Now I understand there's been an evolution in your thinking, but uh, yesterday it seemed to go a little farther in that uh, the secretary said, <coughs> we see Syria fundamentally very similar, talking about the US and Russia, uh, and the only thing he pinpointed was a U.S. belief, and that was his word, that Assad should leave one day, not a U.S. policy with a strategy for implementing that. Well, so can you explain how, when this latest uh, shift toward belief came into play and when you sort of kind of gave up on getting him out immediately? Nobody's given up on the notion that Assad has to go. Um, and that has remained uh, our policy for a long time. Um, and we could quibble over words and rhetoric, but uh, nothing has changed about our view, our belief, that Assad cannot be the future of Syria, uh, and that if we're going to meet the, the Geneva communique, and if we're all going to strive to get to a unified whole Syria uh, through a transition that's Syrian-led, and that includes the voice of the Syrian people, uh, I don't think anybody rationally can think that 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 even in the minds of most Syrians uh, that Assad uh, is the right leader for the country. So nothing's changed about our view that he has to go. But the secretary has said, and he's been saying it for quite a while, I could pull you the quotes and the dates that he said it, is that as we work through this process, um, it's more important for us that the end result is a a government away from Assad and towards one that is respectful of and responsive to the Syrian people, not necessarily that he goes on day one or, or week one or month one of the process. Um, so um, I, I'm not aware of an evolution here in, in thinking. Um, we still remain committed to Assad's departure. Uh, again, we're also mindful in, in this process, the Vienna process, that not everybody in the international community, certainly not everybody even in the ISSG, has exactly the same views with respect to Assad's future, which is why it's so important to keep meeting and why it's, it's so important to, to keep having these discussions. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I've seen press coverage that would indicate that, you know, we've, we've gone through some metamorphosis or some transformation uh, that, we, uh, that we're all of a sudden taking the Russian view, and it's just not so. Um, I have one, one more along similar lines. Um, the Geneva communique from 2012, which you say undergirds this whole process, uh, immediately after that was reached, Secretary Clinton at the time said that meant Assad and his cronies, those were her terms, couldn't be part of the unity government because of mutual consent. He wouldn't be able to be part of the unity government. Um, Yesterday, uh, Secretary Kerry said the notion of Assad leaving immediately uh, was a non-starter. I just wanted to know, how does it help the opposition that you're supporting when, you know, their number one backer says that their opening stance is a non-starter? Well, there's a lot that helps the opposition here. First, that, that, they, that they, look, that they got together at all, which... I seem to be one of the only few here in the briefing room that thinks that this is significant, that you got 116 participants in the opposition together in one room to talk about, too. huh? This has happened before as well. To talk about the future of Syria and to actually come together, and I don't think it has happened before, that they came together with a set of a dozen unifying principles. Now, uh, that does, this, this was their, these are their views. They are not necessarily representative of the views of every other member of the ISSG. This is not, this wasn't, this, this was a meeting of the opposition groups convened by, by Saudi Arabia. Um, the ISSG has already spoken to this issue many times, and you've seen it in the communiques coming out of Vienna. Um, and so 
the secretary was absolutely 100% right when he said that in the view of the international community embodied in the ISSG, the, the notion that he has to go immediately or on day one, however you want to phrase it, that, that is a non-starting position in the view of the ISSG. Um, so we recognize that. So, so we recognize that as a body, the ISSG may have or has a different sense of what a political transition might look like than the group of opposition groups. So what does that tell you? That there's still more work to be done, that there's still differences to solve, that there are still debates and discussions and negotiations that have to occur. And that's why it's so important to get together uh, on Friday in New York to have these sets of meetings. John, just to follow up very quickly, uh, uh, when the secretary says it's a non-starter, he's talking about the launching or the beginning of the negotiations, correct? He's, 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 talking, he's about talking about their view that mm, right. that was expressed in that right. communique that at the beginning okay. of the po that, that before of negotiations the can begin, right. Assad has okay. to depart. Okay, so uh, he's not conditioning the beginning of the negotiations with Assad's departure. But is there an understanding that at the end of this process, Assad will have to be gone? There's a general. There's an understanding that right. we have to get to a government right. that is that uh, that is responsive mm -hmm. and representative of the Syrian people. Obviously, that's not the Assad regime. There's an understanding, and it's all laid out in the communique that this transition to that government has to be Syrian-led and has to include the voices of the Syrian people, uh, which would convey that also Assad's not going to be at the end. And we have said consistently. And we're not the only na nation inside the ISG who has said this, mm -hmm. that Assad can't be part of the future of Syria. But we have said the manner in which he goes, the when, the how, the where to, all of that has yet to be decided, which is why it's important to continue this process. Okay, I just want to follow up on uh, Brad's point, because we all remember when Secretary Clinton said that uh, Assad and his cronies. What is meant by cronies? Are we talking about the regime? Are we talking about the whole apparatus? Is it similar to Iraq? Because there was also an open letter sent out by your last envoy to Syria, Robert Ford, saying that it's not only Assad, but also those uh, close to him and so on. So we're beginning to see that, you know, the demand for Assad departure may include the government or the system or the security services or the army, which, well, you know, bring in a situation similar to that of Iraq. Well, I'm, I, I'm not going to be able to list for you right. who or who isn't a quote-unquote crony. Right. Uh, obviously, there are people close to Assad and, and uh, um, uh, you know, d deeply loyal to him who are complicit in um, the atrocities that he's uh, perpetrating against his people. And I assume, you have to assume, that that will be part of these discussions, who they are and, and what their future is too. I don't want to get ahead of that. But what the secretary has also said is, as we work through this transition, it's important that the institutions of government, the functioning institutions, the institutions <coughs> that the people of Syria are going to need to continue to rely on, uh, need to stay in place. That, that, so whether it's, it's economic, educational, perhaps even military, some of those institutions have got to stay in place. But what they look like, who leads them, how they're administered going forward, all of that's going to be part of the negotiations, which is why it's so important to get the parties together as early in the next year as possible. I, I just couldn't tell you exactly what that's going to be right now. That's why it's important to keep having these meetings. And my last point is on the opposition. The latest reports suggest that the Free Syrian Army, which you invested so much in, is basically collapsing. People are, you know, joining, uh, defecting and joining other groups and so on. That, and that is the most moderate group. I mean, listening to the debate last night, it was quite enlightening. Some of the debaters were saying, who are these moderate opposition groups that you keep talking about? Who are they? Oh, so, I, I mean, we've talked about this uh, a lot. I, I'm not going to, uh, I'm certainly not going to parry and thrust campaign rhetoric. I won't do that. Um, uh, we've long said the opposition groups are fluid uh, and that people do come and go. Um, we've admitted that even in some opposition groups, people people can develop over time extreme views that no longer represent uh, the moderate views of the opposition group that they joined. It's a fluid, dynamic environment. We understand that. 
But we also recognize that there are lots of moderate opposition groups. And to answer your question, look at what happened in Riyadh last week. There's your answer. There's your moderate opposition. Uh, 116 participants of the opposition got together uh, to talk about the future of Syria and what and what they want to see out of this political process. So uh, to deny that there's a moderate opposition, I think, just belies the facts. Since we, since we had, hang on a second, since we had a big meeting in Riyadh. Uh, the- and, and we recognize it's a fluid situation. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't mean that a, a moderate opposition doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean, and you don't have to look any more than, closer than the communique that came out of Riyadh to see that they are capable of unifying around some core principles and they're capable of deriving for themselves those negotiating points that they feel are important to take forward. Do you consider Arar al-Sham a moderate opposition? I don't. There's a process right going on right now that's going to work through this. The Jordanians are, are leading. Uh, we've talked about this group in the past. We, uh, we've been honest about the concerns that we've had uh, about some of their behavior. But they were at the Saudi conference. They were. They and they were. were they're so moderate that you've never given them any we, any they material were, assistance they at were, all. That, that conference was convened by the Saudis. I've said before, we did not get into, we provided our input. Um, and the Saudis convened this group, uh, the, the conference. Um, the work about who is going to be able to move forward um, in a political process is still being done by Jordan. We need to wait to get the results of that. You just described them as the moderate opposition. I said that if you look and you, all you have to do is to, to deny that there is a moderate opposition, which was the premise of the question. Okay. Uh, uh, all you have to do is look at what happened in Riyadh to see that there is, in fact. I didn't go through the list of every single group that was invited to Saudi so and some, make a determination. Some in Riyadh made it more moderate. That's your position. Absolutely. Okay. What, what constitutes success for you on Friday? Well, there's, there's two components to, to Friday, and I kind of alluded to this in the, uh, in the uh, opening statement. The morning will be another round of the ISSG. Um, it will be uh, uh, the, roughly the same 20 participants that, that, were in the, that uh, participated in Vienna. At least that's, that's the going in work that's being done, and those are the same participants being invited. Um, And so the goal there is to continue uh, to try to better define uh, what we think the uh, political transition and the process itself should look like, um, to try to uh, put more fidelity on uh, the the notion of a ceasefire, um, and again, how that would be uh, monitored and implemented, and to have for the benefit of the whole group uh, a chance to learn uh, more about uh, what uh, what happened in Riyadh, um, to sort of read that out and make sure that everybody has a, a common sense of understanding about that. Then in the afternoon, uh, meetings at the UN, uh, the goal there uh, is to arrive at a resolution, a UNSC resolution, that codifies the, the, the very process that we've been talking about under UN auspices. Um, we talked about a little bit about this yesterday. The pieces of that would be, again, the political transition, describing that process, the process that was laid out in Vienna uh, uh, about the, you know, the six-month talks between the opposition and the Assad regime, and then the 18 months uh, subsequent to get at the drafting of a constitution, but to codify all that, as well as hopefully and potentially codify some framework pieces about uh, a ceasefire. What what does um, getting more fidelity on the notion of a ceasefire mean? Well, I think you know more clarity or it a deeper sense of understanding of what that would look like and how it would, I mean, how it would be implemented, monitored, you know, um, how it could be most successful. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, as you well know, Arshad, I mean, ceasefires are complicated things. Um, and they're complicated things to, uh, to keep track of. They're complicated things to see succeed. And so obviously that's going to be all the more so in a place like Syria. 
So there's lots of details that have to be hammered out about that. Do, do you want to have monitors on the ground? Again, those are the kinds of modalities that I, I think need to be need to be fleshed out. Well, g given how loath um, most uh, governments have been to committing troops to uh, ground troops to Syria, um, what makes you think that governments would be willing to have monitors on the ground? Or is that just off the table? No, I, I don't think we're at the stage now where we're ruling anything in or out in terms of monitoring. Um, it's important that that just like the political process, we'd want the ceasefire to be under UN auspices. Um, and the UN has a history of monitoring ceasefires in the past. Um, but how that would be done, um, uh, with what resources to include manpower, I, I think we, uh, we couldn't possibly answer that question for you. I mean, that's part of why it's important to continue these discussions. John, just quickly to follow up on this composition of the new Islamic front that is led by Saudi Arabia with so many different countries. It uh, I conspicuously excludes Iraq and Syria, which are in the forefront in the fight against ISIS. Is that logical or illogical in your, in your judgment? I think you should talk to the Saudi government here about this decision that they've, they, this coalition that they've talked about. This was, this was a, this was led by Arab states there. Okay. And how do you envision their participation? How, how should it be? Like one unified army would have, you know, it's not for us to say, Saeed. Right. It's, it's for it's for the Arab states to talk about. The, 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 we, as I said yesterday, uh, mm -hmm. right. we would like to know a little bit more about this proposal. Right. Okay. But in the aggregate, uh, as it represents uh, an effort to coalesce mm -hmm. those states against terrorist threats to include ISIL, um, and that's what we've been wanting to see is intensification by everybody. Uh, against this threat. I mean, that's welcome, but there's a lot more we would still like to know about it. Yeah, just following up on what you said yesterday, I mean, do you take this coalition or whatever statement was made uh, in the Saudi press uh, about this coalition uh, as, uh, as solid, uh, their commitment is solid, or is it just another announcement in, in a series of announcements that were made in the past and so on? where nothing really has materialized on the ground. I mean, do you see this really happening and coalescing in a way where it can impact the situation in the field, on the ground? We certainly welcome the announcement. There's more yet that we, we need to know, <coughs> uh, that we'd like to know. Um, but we certainly welcome the announcement. And, and, uh, uh, and we obviously, uh, anything that could lead to uh, a more multilateral, effective manner of bringing resources to bear against ISIL and intensifying efforts to degrade and destroy their capabilities. Obviously, that would be that's a good thing. Um, and uh, so, to the degree this coalition that they've talked about can help us all get there uh, as an international community, uh, that that would. You know that's obviously very positive, but there's a lot we still would like to, to to know about it, and and we'll see. I would remind you, as I said yesterday, all those nations uh, are part of the 65 nation coalition that are fighting ISIL, uh, and everybody understands, well understands that the locus of energy uh, against ISIL is in Iraq and in Syria. I think that that goes without saying. The Deputy Crown Prince said the reason for creating it was because these countries are uncoordinated currently in how they fight ISIL. I thought they were all part of your coalition and you were coordinating them. They are part of the coalition. Um, we, it, it's, it's not uh, uh, efforts that every nation is applying against ISIL inside the coalition are coordinated, but they are also that, now, we're talking military efforts, um, particularly air power and whatever forces are on the ground in, in a train and assist. All that is coordinated. Um, but not every nation brings to the coalition military prowess. Mm -hmm. uh, some, many contribute in many different ways. He, he said it. It's not me saying it. He said it was uncoordinated, and that's why they Well, I'll let him this. speak for his views. I mean, You, you if, disagree with that. I, I, when... We're talking about military coalition efforts against ISIL. They are coordinated. They are obviously coordinated. Um, 
in fact, you know, we've had this debate about Russia, right? Mm -hmm. And how come we're not coordinating with Russia? And, and, and but because they they don't share the same objecti objectives as the coalition. Um, so the military efforts are well coordinated. There's no doubt about that. But not every nation brings to the coalition military prowess and military capabilities, as I said. I, I don't. I, I did not see those comments. I would not speak for the deputy crown prince and what he meant. Um, uh, but if he's referring to the fact that that Arab nations can do more and can contribute more and can maybe do so in a in a, in a better team effort, well, you know, I certainly am in no position to to uh, to question that assessment um, since he's living there and since he's a, a leader in his nation. Um, as I said to Saeed, if if this effort leads to more intensification and more efficiency and effectiveness against ISIL, that's a good thing. Did they, well, one last one, did they coordinate this announcement with you or let you know ahead of time they were going to announce this new coalition? Well, you know, we don't talk about diplomatic discussions, but, uh, but we were not surprised by it. So one, one other question on this, if I may. There are governments that say that they were uh, invited to share in some kind of a uh, kind of intelligence sharing or coordination center in Saudi Arabia, and that what the Saudi uh, senior officials announced in a coalition was 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 not something that they were given to understand. We've got officials from Indonesia saying this, and officials saying this on the record. D does that give you pause? that there doesn't seem to be clarity on the part of all of the members of this uh, uh, coalition on what it's supposed to do, and some of them didn't understand what they were signing up to? Again, I, I would let, I'd have to let those nations speak for themselves. Um, is one point that I didn't make that I think is important to, 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 to say, and the Deputy Crown Prince said as much uh, when they announced this, is, is this isn't just about ISIL. This is about violent extremism and terrorism and the threats writ large that emanate from that. Um, yeah, so our sense is, based on their comments about this, that they're taking a broader view here, a broader regional view than just ISIL, which is, of course, the most significant threat we all face. But as for um, uh, plans to set up a coordination center and uh, or an information sharing hub, whatever you want to call it, and how that's materializing, you know, I, I, I would point you to Saudi authorities to speak to how they've done that and the degree to which they've communicated that to, to other nations. That's, that's, we, we, we are not party to this, to this effort, and it would be inappropriate for me to, to speculate about the, the process under which they're establishing it. It doesn't worry you, though, that they're clearly, this is not, does not seem to be all knitted up here? I, no, I, I, why wouldn't it? We, we, we want all nations, and particularly in the region, to do everything they can against the threat of terrorism. We certainly want to see all na nations in the region step up and intensify their efforts against ISIL. No question. We are doing the same. We, we've taken a hard look at what we're doing against ISIL, and we've decided to intensify our, our efforts too. So we'd like to see all that as, uh, as coordinated as possible. But again, without having direct knowledge of uh, the process itself through which this was established um, and the communication that was done to establish it, it's, it's hard for me to, to answer your question. Can you? Yeah. Can you answer that from Azerbaijan? How do you assess the uh, meeting between uh, Chairman James Warlick and separatists in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh? A couple of days ago, the chairman met uh, with separatists in the Congress. How do you to assess it? Uh, I don't know that I... I may have to take your question, ma'am. I don't know that I have uh, a reaction for you on on that uh, specific specific issue. Okay, let me let me take the, let me take the question for you. Yeah. Yes. Um, on Taiwan, uh, China criticized the uh, the U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. Do you have a response to their opposition? Yeah. Um, were you talking about the meeting? In late December, is that what you're talking about? Yes. I might have something on that. <laughs> Surprise. It took me a little while. No, no, it just came, yeah, I just flipped to it. Uh, so this is a, you're talking about a meeting between our Azerbaijani and Armenian presidents, it's supposed to be held at 
at the end of late December? Is that what your question was? Uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 how do you assess the meeting, uh, meeting between the chairman, uh, James, James Warlick, and separatists in Nagorno Karabakh? Because uh, last day ago, uh, uh, meet with separatists in the Congress. Yep, we're going to have to take that one. We're going to have to take that one. You asked about uh, Taiwan. All right, let me hang on a second here. What? So today, the administration notified Congress of a $1.83 billion defense arms sales package to Taiwan. <coughs> this notification follows previous notifications uh, by the administration totaling over $12 billion. Today's notification is consistent with the Taiwan Relations Act and our support for Taiwan's ability to maintain a sufficient self-defense capability. There's no change to our long-standing One China policy uh, uh, based on the three joint communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act. Jenny. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. North Korea. You guys fight it out. Yeah. Which one do you want? Follow up. Follow up. Follow up. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead, follow up. Thank you. Go ahead, follow up. So Justin says it's worth asking about. That's a lot. Billion. Um, what could you tell us what makes you to decide to sell arms to Taiwan after four years? You haven't done anything. What makes what? What makes you to decide to make this decision after four years? You haven't sold any arms to Taiwan in the past four years. Why now? Uh, look, we make decisions on uh, arms sales to Taiwan based on our assessment of Taiwan's defense needs, period. Uh, and uh, uh, we've been in, uh, I mean, this is not something that hasn't been long in coming. It's, you know, but we make these decisions based on on uh, our assessment of Taiwan's defense needs. Um, but that's well, the only factor. Well, we have seen recently the cross-strait relation has been improved. The, Two leaders has they just have a historic meeting in Singapore last month, and they also with China also have lots of close cooperation in many areas. So, do you take these factors into your consideration? The factors that we take into consideration are is our assessment of Taiwan's defense needs. Always has been, and and uh, will continue to be, the deciding factor for for these sales. But would you um? Consider to try to minimize the repercussion for U.S.-China relation. This we, this is not a new thing. Uh, uh, our support to uh, the defense needs of Taiwan. Uh, nothing's changed about our one-China policy, and as I said at the outset, these sales uh, are uh, in complete concert with that policy. They're done based on a, a clear-eyed assessment of Taiwan's defense needs. Um, as for our relationship with uh, with the, with China, that is remains an important relationship that we're going to continue to work at, um, uh, and uh, because we are being consistent, uh, uh, there's no other message that needs to be taken away from this other than that we take seriously. Uh, you know, our commitment to the defense needs of Taiwan. But uh, just last one, uh, the Chinese foreign ministry actually just said they asked the U.S. to, to cancel the sales to, to Taiwan to avoid harming its relation across the Taiwan Strait and between U.S. and China. Well, look, I mean, the, the Chinese can react to this as they see fit. This is nothing new. Um, again, it's a clear-eyed, sober view uh, of, of an assessment of Taiwan's defense needs, um, and that's what drove this. Um, there's no need for it to have uh, any derogatory effect on our relationship with China. Uh, just like it, there was no need in the past for it to ever have uh, that effect uh, on China. Uh, we still want to work to establish a better, more transparent, uh, more effective relationship with China in the region, and we're going to continue to work at that. One is that you did not consult with China on this arms sale, do you? And then secondly, you just said that this arms sale is a reflection of assessment of Taiwan's self-defense capability. Um, so is this sale a reflection that Taiwan is not, does not have enough? Uh, no, no, it's based on an assessment of Taiwan's defense needs, which 
we routinely conduct, period. That's it. Um, and we have been in contact uh, with Taiwan and PRC counterparts uh, today on this very matter. I'm not going to get into the detail of diplomatic discussions, but we have been in contact. You have been in contact with PRC today regarding this arms sale? Yes. Did you tell them before or after you notified I would just tell you that Congress. we've been in contact with them today, and I won't talk about the details of diplomatic discussions. Is it was, it, it, was it after the notification to Congress? I can't imagine you tell them before, but... I, I won't go any farther than I just did. I mean, it seems like... Sorry, a follow up on that. Uh, it seems like the message from the Chinese government is that uh, this will negatively impact cross-strait relations. Is that not a concern? You'd have to talk to the Chinese about that and their view of this. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to speak for them. Um, as I said, this is based on an assessment of Taiwan's defense needs. It's in keeping with our policy. Um, there's no change in that. Um, and there's no reason for this to have a derogatory effect uh, on the relationship uh, with China. Um, it's based on a clear, sober-eyed, a sober, clear-eyed view of our assessment of Taiwan's defense needs. I'm going to have to only take a couple more, and then I'm going to have to go. Yeah. Uh, back on Syria real quick. Yeah. It sounds like U.S. and Russia are narrowing their division on the lists, who's a terrorist, who's not a terrorist, who's in the opposition. Do you hope to further close that gap on Friday? Uh, I think we need to see what comes out of Jordan um, you know, before we can make a definitive statement about uh, closing any gaps. Um, and I won't, uh, until Friday, I don't think it'd be appropriate for me to, to get out ahead of that process. Uh, I think the Secretary spoke to this in Moscow yesterday, that it was a good discussion uh, with Foreign Minister Lavrov and President Putin, um, and that they are both working hard to try um, uh, to, uh, to solidify uh, not just our views about what a political transition can look like, but the international community. So, uh, again, without getting into details and getting ahead of the meeting on Friday, I could just say that the, 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 there is solid political momentum here and diplomatic yeah. momentum as well. We want to see what uh, the Jordanian effort produces before I think anybody's going to be able to sort of make a make a call here one way or the other if there are these if there are differences could it are you concerned it could complicate or stall the process in any way you know these lists with the various gaps if there's are if there's if there's differences even you know after jordan u.s russia well, i mean there's obviously there's still differences of opinion about a lot of things hmm. uh with respect to the political future of syria uh, if there weren't there'd be no reason to sit down and and, and talk uh, on friday in new york and as I've said earlier, I think you can fully expect that there'll be additional multilateral settings going forward. Uh, I, nobody expects coming out of New York City on Friday that, that every issue is going to be resolved. So um, that's the task of diplomacy. That's what, it, that's what it's all about, is to try to, to narrow the gaps as much as possible and to make the necessary compromises uh, for the greater good. And that's why it's important, again, to, to, to go to New York and to continue these discussions. But you know, if you're asking me is if if remaining gaps are going to sort of put a grind or halt the, the process, I don't believe the secretary thinks that, that, that that's the case at all. I mean, mm -hmm. for him, it's it, it makes it all the more important to continue the process because there are still differences and because there are still things that need to be resolved, John. not just between the United States and Russia, but mm -hmm. um, but inside the the ISSG writ large. Yeah. Do you any draft to you? I mean, to, to understand the process, because Jordanians, uh, the list will be a suggestion, right? I mean, what's... As far as I know, the that work is still ongoing, um, and uh, and it's an iterative process. So I, I don't want to I don't want to set up the expectation that this is some sort of homework assignment where, you know, they no, just no. But I mean, did, did you receive any draft, and did you reply to Jordanians on this draft? Uh, as I said, it's an iterative process. The work's ongoing. I, I don't have a report or a report card to hand to you and show you what it is. Uh, the Jordanians are still working their way through this. Um, and if that work is uh, complete uh, in time for the discussion in New York so that the international community, the ISSG, which Jordan is a member, can sit down and, and talk about it, then, then they will. Um, but if it's not done, that doesn't mean the meeting in New York still won't happen and still won't be.
be important. Now, all the ISCCG members gi give this authority to Jordanians? I mean, how they will determine the groups, for example? It was a By consensus or... view coming out of Vienna that Jordan would take the lead and, and, and work on this, and they are. Could you please provide some explanations on yesterday's statement of uh, John Kerry in Moscow saying that uh, if uh, Minsk agreement uh, are implemented in full, uh, sanctions against Russia could be lifted? And does it mean that Crimea issue is no more on the table anymore? And Does that mean that what's not on the table anymore? Crimean issue. The annexation of Crimea is not an issue and not a strong argument for... No, we still don't recognize the annexation of Crimea. It, that, that very much is still an issue. And the, the sec secretary said that there, will, there, there can be no sanctions relief uh, with respect to eastern Ukraine without, without uh, a Minsk agreement being fully implemented. And, uh, you know, look, the onus, is on, the onus is on Russia to meet its commitments. He was very clear about that. Maybe a question on this. This is on the, the uh, President Putin's decision to subs suspend the free trade agreement with Ukraine. I'm sorry. The, the Russian President Putin today said that he had made a decision to suspend a 2011 free trade agreement that uh, the United that Russia and Ukraine had had. Do you have anything on that? Yeah, I don't know if I do. Well, it's not in my Ukraine tab. Let me see if it's in my Russia tab. Is that where it is? I'll have to take the question okay. and get back yep. to you. Also on Ukraine? Um, yesterday, the secretary said twice something to the effect of there is no policy of the U.S. to isolate Russia. <coughs> I remember after uh, it's the season, the annexation of Crimea, uh, the president himself spoke about taking steps uh, that will isolate Russia. Uh, when did this policy change that no longer are you actually taking steps or trying to isolate Russia? There's no, there, there's no change to talk about, Brad. Oh, what we what not. we've said is what we said is Russia will, as it, it with respect to Ukraine and Crimea, that they took actions that isolated themselves, um, and that the sanctions uh, were only going to make it, were only going to raise the cost on Russia. Um, as a result of their own actions, which were isolating themselves, um, and that's what the secretary is referring to. There's not a there's not a there's not an uh, object policy in place that you know is you pull it off the shelf and here's the isolate Russia policy. And there they are they they there are through, their, they are like through their own actions right. isolating themselves, um, and that's why the secretary raised the issue in Moscow and thought it was important to do so. Gotta go, guys. I gotta go. Oh, I'm sorry. You, I promise you. Wait, one more question. North okay, uh, uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong Un had has admitted that the recently got a I mean a hydrogen bomb to pursue the China to exert influence in North Korea. Do you think China is cooperating with the United States? Uh, I, I don't have anything for you on that, Jenny, and uh, we wouldn't talk about intelligence matters anyway. All right, thank you. All right, thanks.